Um, I don't ever do this. This is a unique occasion for me. I have notes. And of course, I can't read them. <laughs> that serves me right. Okay, uh, I was going to talk a little bit about the fact that music is physical. Yeah. It's a very physical thing. It's not like looking at things. Sound hits us. Yeah. Sound is like an ocean wave, only not as wet. And um, in any case, it used to be physical. It used to be physical, and then something happened. And that something happened in a few steps. Uh, first of all, once upon a time, as we say in English, uh, all composers were players. Composers touched sound directly. And then, in sophisticated societies, like yours and Europeans, not American, um, there was a, a demarcation made between composers and players. We developed a two-class society, the beginning of the class structure. But I won't bore you with a Marxist analysis of that. Um, and the only rebels in this were the improvisers. And you can detect the little quotation marks I put around it, improvisers. Uh, or as it's sometimes called, uh, instant composition. And these were the people who retained the physicality. Okay. Um, now, ironically, as composers became more cerebral, we might say, while players retained a healthy connection to their bodies, um, the earliest electronic music was surprisingly physical. You know? I mean, the first instrument we think of is uh, the theremin. It was 1920. Lev Theremin actually gave a performance for Lennon, and I don't mean John Lennon, revolutionary instrument. <laughs> and um, it was a physical instrument that was meant to be played on stage. Um, John Cage's Imaginary Landscape No. 1 in 1939, which was written for piano, uh, bowed cymbal, and turntable, was perhaps the first performance DJ piece. John Cage hated pop music, but ironically, he invented the DJ. That's life, John. Um, and. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that electronic music as an art form was somewhat taken over by ideas about film production. That I think the tools of montage in film were so powerful that composers could not resist. And uh, Walter Ruttmann quite famously did a 1930 uh, tape music piece called Wochenend, Weekend just using the sound portion of film. It's like a film without a light bulb. Okay. Um, and the music concrete composers in working in Paris after the war, late 40s, they took the DJ off the stage and put him in the studio. Him, I'm afraid most of them were men. And um, ironically, they were, they were cutting and scratching and and pushing discs around, but they were doing it behind closed doors. And with tape, uh, cutting and splicing replaced cutting and scratching. You know? And um, for a long time, in the 50s and early 60s, electronic music meant tape music. And the body was gone. Yeah. Electronic music was a dream at that time. Disconnected. Um, but around 1967, as Taku said, God bless the Dutch, they had an idea. And um, for, for reasons that are still a little unclear to me, despite my years in Holland, a bunch of guys, guys, Dutch composers who were known as the notenkakers, the, uh, the, the note breakers, uh, got together and decided that they wanted to perform electronic music live as a part of essentially a new form of music theater that they were developing. It was highly political. And in any case, Stein was founded, according to the story I was given, there are many different ones, 
to provide technical assistance and technical development for that. And it was the first foundation, first institution in the world to do that. There were electronic music studios in a few countries, we have one here, that created electronic work for avant-garde composers. Stein was the first place that specifically tried to develop tools to get electronic music out of the studio and onto the stage. Now, there were parallels happening in the United States at this time. In 1960, John Cage returned to the record player with a work called Cartridge Music. It is what I call discless jockeying. He took the needles out of the cartridges on a record player, that's the part that actually picks up the groove, and stuck other things inside. It's kind of the thing a seven-year-old would do, you know, but that's what the avant-garde usually does. So, he used these cartridges as a way to amplify enormously very quiet sounds. This was a very loud piece that came from very small sounds, the sound of a spring being stretched or a twig snapping. And he inspired and corrupted a lot of young American composers who were trying to find, I like to think they were trying to find a truly American art form, working with technology that was an American kind of high-visibility product in the 60s, and tried to come up with something that was not just sitting on the shoulders of Herr Beethoven. So, musicians like David Tudor and the Sonic Arts Union, Gordon Mumma, David Behrman, Alvin Lussier, Robert Ashley, began to work with very cheap, affordable electronic technology to try to perform live. And this was right at the same time that the Notenkrakers were developing these tools in Amsterdam. However, we didn't have a nice foundation. All we had were two sticks to rub together and make fire. From a cultural standpoint, the United States has been very much like a third world country. Yes, we've had to develop things in poverty. I studied at Wesleyan University in the United States, outside of New York City, with Alvin Lussier in the early 1970s. And at the same time, I learned to make electronic circuits, working with David Tudor, who was an assistant, mostly known as an assistant to John Cage, and David Barron, another member of the Sonic Arts Union. I moved to San Francisco at the end of the 70s, and began programming with very, very early primitive microcomputers, pre-laptop laptops. And so, had my feet in, first in the stream of homemade circuitry, and then in very early computer music. I moved back to New York City in 1980, and the physicality of electronics and live performance, we like to say, is it ratcheted up two notches. It went from 10 to 11, and then to 12, okay? And there were two reasons for me. One was my loft that I was living in, which was constantly falling apart, had the great advantage of being almost exactly across the street from CDGs, the famous club. And I couldn't help but notice that guitar bands looked much better on stage than those of us who were turning small electronic knobs. And obviously, music is about more than fashion and picking up boys and girls. But at the same time, it was obvious that audiences expected a certain degree of physicality in New York in the 80s. And if you weren't going to give it to them, they weren't going to pay attention to you. So, I developed instruments that I called backwards electric guitars. These were guitars that instead of hitting the strings with your right hand, 
you would play sound into the pickup. And the pickup would act like a speaker, and it would resonate with strings. It was like when you walk up to a piano, and you put your foot on the sustain pedal, and you shout into it, you go, oh! And you could hear the ringing of the strings. So it was like a big filter for any sound, just like a filter on a Moog synthesizer. But A, it was very cheap, because I bought very cheap and very ugly guitars to do this to. And the other thing was that it was a filter that you could process and play just like a guitar. You could put fuzz on it and echo and delay, and you change the tuning of the strings instead of the tuning of the filter. It was very physical. And if you put three beautiful people on stage playing these instruments, it was bizarre, because they were like guitarists with only one hand. They never, they never had to strum. It looked good. It looked good. I opened for Reese Chatham at CBGB's, and within 30 seconds of getting on stage, the guy right there said, get off the stage. But I did try, and I say we looked pretty good. Um, the other thing was that I started to work with improvising musicians in downtown New York, and, and one of the, uh, this isolation of improvisers from the rest of the musical mainstream continued. Uh, I discovered when I got to New York and that the world of composition and the world of improvisation was somewhat separated by geography. I was living in the heart of improviser country. And so I started working um, first with downtown New York improvisers and then as I got into it more with players in other places in the world, um, many, many places. Uh, George Lewis, a wonderful trombonist and computer music composer, said, uh, one said, I was the first guy to put a computer on a bar stage, which might be true. And I developed an instrument specifically for uh, working with live improvisation. Um, this was 1987, and uh, it was, uh, as, as it's been explained here, very early technology. I built sort of a homemade digital signal processor for sampling and processing sound live, live sampling before there were programs to do it. And um, what I realized was that I needed to do big gestures on stage in order to be seen when there were people playing instruments like cello and drums and guitar. So I said, I want a really big mouse, huge mouse, a rat. Maybe, instead of a mouse. Or I need a slider, like on a mixer, that's really, really big. And I thought, ah, that's what a trombone is, a big slider. So, basically, I hooked up a trombone slide to a mouse. I put keys on the trombone slide so that I could click and drag different parts of my program. And then I put a speaker on the trombone so that the sound would come back through the instrument. And then if I was on stage with a player of a trumpet or a banjo or a violin, I had an acoustic presence on the stage. You know what I mean? And it balanced a bit better. So that instrument looks like this. Normally, this has no sounds of its own. It always, I always take sounds from other players. But I recently built a jukebox into the computer program so that when I have no musician, I can just uh, shuffle through my whole uh, set of, of records and pick random locations on them.
to make it relevant to students who could choose from a wide array of tools that were not available when I was that age, but still wanted to do things that you couldn't do with a laptop. And that's what it's about. I mean, I, I introduced this course in hardware hacking. It was not anti-computer, but it was like computer's little buddy. You know, it was doing the stuff that the computer had a difficult time doing. Yeah. So, what we do, I'm losing my place here. Um, we start with listening. We start by making all kinds of unusual microphones for hearing the world, because it's, it's an old idea about how you do music, you know, listening and imitation. So I want to sharpen their hearing. So we make contact microphones. We use coils of wire to pick up electromagnetic fields from emanating from computers and microwave ovens and subway trains. Uh, we take tape heads out of old Walkman and boom boxes, and we listen to the data on um, transit cards and credit cards. We scratch tape like you scratch turn tables. And then we do what's known as circuit bending. We open up toys and other pieces of found technology, guitar effects, pedals, whatever, and we change them, we personalize them. It's like getting a can of soup at the supermarket and throwing in some hot sauce when you cook it. Personalizing the mass produce. And um, then we go on and we actually make our own circuits from scratch, very simple ones. And I try to create a, a small number of circuit choices that were very easy to put together that never, ever, ever blew up in your face. And you could combine in different permutations. I said it was like Lego. When I was a child, Lego, they only seemed to have three sizes of brick. But you could make anything out of it, well, except a wheel. And um, I took a sort of Lego approach to working with electronics. And all along, the emphasis has always been on touch, yeah? on touching things. So for example, one of the first things we do is we, we take a radio. And this is a radio that's in a cigar box. Don't ask. Well, I'm not picking up any stations, but you can you can tell it's a radio. Believe me, right? <laughs> but then what I do is I lift my fingers. I know your mother's told me not to do this, right? But, like the crackle box, you know. Another point of connection, and this is, Michelle talks about the roots of the crackle box were him doing exactly this, but unfortunately Michelle did it on a radio that connected to the wall, and he was, touched the wrong point, was thrown across the room, and he says his father then nailed the wall and the radio together so he couldn't do this, and that's why they had to make the crackle box. But that's a thing that's difficult to do with a laptop. You, you cannot lick a laptop. You know? Well, you can, but it's not going to do much for you. Um, so, in any case, this uh, class that I started teaching at the Art Institute uh, spread into workshops that I started doing in all sorts of places, and then I was asked to do a book uh, on it, and, and the book was published, and now I have what my children call my cult of people who send me emails saying, if I take the circuit from chapter 7 and put it inside a cake, what will it do? These sorts of things. Um, and, and that is what has brought me here, in large part, is that um, thanks to uh, Mr. Kuboto-san, I did two days of a hacking workshop in conjunction with the Stein residency at Tama and um, introduced um, 
these students to, to what is, in a sense, the roots of Stein, uh, the roots of Nick Collins. And um, to wax metaphorical, if these roots uh, get started here in Japan, for all we know, uh, people won't have to fly to Stein halfway around the world to do their uh, workshops and orientations, but you can actually grow a fresh Stein right here in Japan, which is actually an interesting idea. Okay, now we come to the end of the talking. I'm sorry, I think I went too long, right? No, I'm okay. 25 minutes. <laughs> that is so good. I can't tell. All right. That's what happens when you lose the paper. I probably, there's a whole middle section of the lecture that's, you know. Okay. So um, here's, here's what we're going to do. Uh, the second part of the physicality of music that I think is very important is people playing together. Um, I think that, generally speaking, uh, not always, but generally speaking, groups of people do more interesting things than people behaving by themselves. They do very romantic things sometimes when there are two. And then when it's more than two, they do exciting things because they can't agree. And when you can't agree in music, that's when stuff gets interesting. Okay. Uh, the best music of the pop bands of my childhood was always recorded when they were fighting with each other. That's what they would do. So um, I continue to try to figure out ways to do electronic music with multiple players, like you have in street quartets or garage bands. Right? So um, out of the workshops that I've done in uh, in this hardware hacking, I've come up with various strategies to exploit these poor students who have volunteered to work with me for a week. And the payoff at the end is not that they have to carry my luggage, which is the way it was when I was a student, but they have to perform in strange pieces of music. So um, as someone working with electronics, I'm very conscious of the uh, negative implications of what is called in English planned obsolescence. You buy a new computer every, what, three years, four years, two years, one year, <coughs> you know, your cell phones in your place all the time. And there are towns in China that are completely polluted with lead and other chemicals as a result of uh, incredibly dangerous recycling and just dumping of this uh, technology. So I decided that I should do a piece that brought dead electronics back to life, like Frankenstein, yeah. bringing a dead circuit back to life. So I, I built a very simple circuit. It's actually a variation on one we always do in the, uh, in the hacking workshop. And I left out a large number of components from the circuit. It's like buying a car with no right front wheel, no left rear brake, no carburetor and no back seat. You know? And what we do is we try to get those parts from the junkyard. So this is from a junkyard in Aix-en-Provence in France. God bless the French. You know, the food is good and their junk is great. And this is a, like every piece of electronic garbage you ever find in France, it came from the phone company. I don't know what they do with the phones in France, but they are forever throwing out circuit boards. Okay? So um, I should have actually gone to a junkyard here to find a board, but I didn't have time. So I brought French French garbage. Uh, vive la différence. And um, we are going to, with six brilliant students from the workshop this last week, we're going to see if we can bring this circuit back to life. So I think this is the time at which I will um, boot up the um, box over here and stop talking and 
you will have a little performance, probably about uh, seven, eight minutes. Uh, and it could be loud enough that you'll leave here happy. You're gonna hear a bang. Okay. So let's see. We need this light on the TV. There we go. Yeah, well I, I can I'm never in focus anyway, so um I think this is alright. About to start. I have to get my conductor's chair. Thank you.
ビジネスで来る方に,こにもコンサートをさせるとそのプロジェクト自体のフォーカスがどうしてもコンサートパフォーマンスの方にいっちゃうんですねそうするとあのやっぱり最終的なあの研究や開発のためにレジデンシーで呼んだのに最後の,、まあ、あの見せる場所だけその最後の形だけにどうしてもフォーカスしちゃうのでそこのところは分け,分けるようにしてます。
There was nothing interesting about any one object. They were very ordinary objects. But when you connected them all together, they made interesting music, like a band. You know, a lot of the people in bands are very boring by themselves. But when you put them together on stage, they make something happen. And I think when you work in this field, you, you do sort of look around for people who might be interested together as a band. You look around for circuits and programs that might interact well together. In any case, that's how I work. I hope that helps. たぶん、あの、えっと、今、その際の、奥さんさんのアーティストの聞きつけさんでした。えっと、あの、質問としてはですね、たぶん、コリンズさんにですね、あの、まさに、ゆきちゃんの中でありましたけれども、その、ジェスチャー、大きなジェスチャーを使って、使って、あの、演奏、表現をする。その、そのそのことによって、身体性を、あの、大変、伝承学の領域の中に持ち込むっていうことを、その、えー、そう言ってたんだけど、まあ、あの小西さん、小さい金では例えば、えー、小さいデバイスになってたりとか、そのえー、ブラックボックス化して、作品がブラックボックス化しているっていうことに、そのまあ、どういう、なんていうんですかね、自分と、まあ、それ以外、なんか変化があるのかどうかってことが、ちょっと分かると思うんですけど。いや、それは非常に面白いです。I used to say that the, the old image of the future was big. You know, if you look at a science fiction movie from the 1950s, a rocket ship, the door inside the, from one part to another had a door handle like this, right? Like, like on a submarine. And in the 1960s with Star Trek, suddenly it was a button. And the future became small instead of big. Historically, The future was big, grand architecture, grand ships, grand machines. Now, the future is small, right? And um, uh, one of the things we could, everyone's been talking about today is the physical nature of, of this work. You know? um, it is, it is, it, it's more difficult to interact, it's more difficult to interact physically with something like this than something like the trombone. You know, it's, it's, the space is confining. So, on the one hand, I think this is fueling a kind of a coolness in music. There's a lot of very cool music around now, electronic music that is not like hardcore or Merzbach. It's very cool. That's the only word you can use, I think. Um, and the way music is consumed these days, it's not so much about jumping up and down and throwing yourself on and off stage, it's about sending files back and forth. You know, people with iPods don't dance, they walk. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's kind of, it's, it, it's a little non-physical. But ironic that Stein is working so much with the Wii controllers, because we, we were talking about this earlier. I remember in the 1980s, companies tried to introduce physical controllers for computer games. Power gloves, you know, and all these things. They never succeeded because gamers said it's not fast enough, a joystick is just fine, thank you. That other stuff is too fancy. The Wii is incredibly popular. And I think finally, after 20 years of trying, you know, they've, they've gotten a technology that's fast enough that a gamer will work. And some of these interfaces are, are interesting. They create social gaming, right? Like these guitar programs, and these fighting programs. Um, so, so maybe this is a little crack in the cool. And maybe we're now going to see some hotter elect electronic music. <laughs> People punching each other, you know, stuff like that. I mean, it, it, it could get very physical despite the smallness I don't know if that helps. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
just on. Hello. Hello. Oh, come on, Sam. Hi. <laughs> um, first, I want to say that um, I'm really very. Imp- I, I don't think this Wait, is on. Wait, we need a different mic. Sam. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. Hello. Uh, first, I just want to say that I'm very impressed with the Stein philosophy that has been expounded here today on staying with uh, your instrument, uh, main, doing something and really spending enough time, maybe years, maybe your whole career, to figure out how to play it and how to continually make it better in small ways. I think that's a great thing, uh, especially in the field of electronic music where there's often so much emphasis on using the next piece of gear and you know, moving on to the next toy. That's a very nice thing. Um, my question, though, was um, I just wanted to know uh, from Robert and Frank how, uh, I guess, to, how, how many musicians through the years have come through Stein with a vision for their instrument or their project uh, who had virtually zero ability at, say, circuitry, uh, creating electronic instruments themselves, but who were simply musicians who wanted to develop an instrument and, well, have the Stein team help them do that in the absence of any actual electronic instrument making abilities of their own. That's what I'd like to Trumpet. 
And uh, he said, well, of course, uh, I definitely want to use the central app with it, and uh, it's an interesting device. And I told him, well, here you have the manual of the programming language. Take a look at it and see what you think. And the next day he came back and he said, well, I looked at it, it's good, and here's the money. And after the trumpet was finished, he left, and I never had to help him. Years later, I met him, of course, again, and he had written huge programs. Typically, somebody, a musician, who's also a very good programmer. This is, by the way, a very rare combination. And the other example is, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the late Tom Cora, who was a great cello player. Um, he came to stand, he had some ideas that he wanted to have foot pedals to control the sound and so on. I talked to him about the central app and what you could do with it, and he said, ah, ah, great, great, fantastic. So I thought, well, handy, he can do it all himself. But I gave him the manual and I said, well, maybe what you should do, look at the manual, anything you don't understand, just underline it. Next day he came back, the first page was completely underlined. So I realized maybe I should do the programming for him. So we always uh, do this kind of mixture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, will, I will just add to what Frank said. It's when I was artistic director at Sign, I felt I was a, more of a psychotherapist than anything else. You, know, you can sit down with artists who were, who, who were very confused and you tried to figure out how they could be less confused. There's actually maybe two things I'd like to add. Um, one is if, if um, we help an artist who has no like, experience in programming or in, in hardware at all, um, there's a danger, of course. We could, of course, build the whole thing. But then if somebody is, is on tour and is on the other side of the world, something breaks down, what are you going to do? So that's, that's why we always encourage people to at least get like the basics of the programming or the soldering or the, the, the circuitry. Uh, another thing is that also if people come to us and they clearly need support, um, we always try to encourage them to find a collaborator, somebody who is technical and who is interested in uh, helping them programming everything, so being like a partner in the project. Um, and of course we have a network, so um, if it's a project that happens in, in Amsterdam, we, there's people around who can ask and we can give them, you know, bring them in contact with, so give you a context.